Hi! For the sixth and final episode of my Best of Leadership series, I've chosen to start with a less known name, Kamal Hassan, giving an inspiring talk at Google, all the way to Jay Banga from MasterCard talking about the importance of knowing who you are and feeling comfortable with who you are. Um, I get terribly concerned when people ask me, how do you do market research? <laughs> I, I don't. Yeah. Th th that's the thing. There's something much deeper and bigger than uh, it, 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 it's, it's your mind, what you love most. Because if you truly believe that you're part of a crowd, then your assumption, your need, your, uh, your passion will be emulated by the crowd. Because you are one of them. You, you've learned your, your accent, your, your weaknesses, your anger, your food taste. It's all from one place. So it's, it's confusing for me to go compute. If I had done that, I would have been in school. I'm a dropper. <laughs> I, I couldn't uh, go that route. But instead of going on an outward travel, I always travel inward. It's a bigger space. Everybody's space is bigger than what they can mm -hmm. possibly traverse with available transport. About women, one of the secret sources for Alibaba's success is that we have a lot of women. What percentage of women in, well, among our Bobby employees? one day before, I think two months before, two or three months before we IPO, there's Ameri there American journalists come to our company. She, she asked me a question. Jack, I've seen so many women in your company. I say, what's wrong? <laughs> we have a leader, we find that, you know, we, we have 30, or, we have 47% of the employees of our company are women. How many? 47% of our company are women. And we actually had a 51 because we acquired some company these days. They have more men, so balance that. <laughs> but these are women in top level positions? 33% of the senior ma of the management are women. And 24% of the senior management, very top level, are Women. We have a women CEO, CFO, CPO, chief people officer, and we have everywhere. And I think so comfortable to working with them because women in this world, if you want to win in 21st century, you have to making sure that making other people powerful, empower others, making sure the other people better than you are, then you will be successful. So I find the women they think about the others more than they think about themselves. Right. Yeah, women yeah. think about the Kids, husband, parents, much more than the man. And the user friendliness. Uh, I, I like to think and uh, in, in communicate in analogies. So we'd say, you know, we, have to, we win together. This is like a team, and, and we have to really function like a team, and we have to have a great team effort. And everybody would say yes. I mean, this for years, people would say yes, because it's kind of an inspiring thing to imagine a team and, you know, if you, whatever coach was popular or, or team was winning and say we can be a team and we can win like this or we could we could win like Michael Jordan and and they uh, in Chicago or we could win like the Green Bay Packers and I what I recognize is that there's different kinds of teams and so a football team which if that's the way you think about teaming uh, the quarterback calls all the plays handles the ball every time and people have very specific assignments uh, you know, a baseball team is substantially the same. A basketball team is different. There's a playmaker. It moves much faster, and everybody handles the ball. And the model that, 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 uh, that I've, uh, I've evangelized in our enterprise, because I think it matches the, the, uh, the business we're in, the fashion business moves very fast. And a lot of people have to make decisions. Uh, and we have to team up and we have to partner up. You know, and there is a coach, there is a playmaker, there are defined positions, if you would, responsibilities. But I'd like people to see it as a basketball team, that fast moving, that interactive, then anyone can score. 
So I think it's useful in our enterprise when we talk about teaming to uh, be specific about what we're referencing. And we've actually made a, a, a movie where we've used some swipes from the NBA to demonstrate speed and agility and the fact that anybody can score. And then you show that next to clips from a baseball where it's you know, painfully slow. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the catcher's going out to the mound to get the signal and then goes back and gets the signal again. It doesn't resemble basketball at all. But that's my, my mental model for team. Of course, in a, in a span of everyone's career, you're going to make some decisions almost on a daily basis that didn't work out exactly as you wanted it to. Um, but the big picture things, the things that really matter, most of the time, even if you're taking a risk, they will work out if you have the humility and the agility to change on the fly. Example. Puerto Rico, you mentioned it. I go into Puerto Rico from New York City, newly married with a newborn baby, beautiful life, everything good. Why would you go to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and take that risk? You're Mr. New York. You know, they're going to give you whatever you want in New York. Why do that? There's two reasons. One, I think the person that always has to have the perfect job What's my salary? What's my bonus? What's my car? Where are you going to put me up? How are you going to remember what a great guy I am? That's one type of employee. And then there's another one that says, I bet these people in important positions are smart enough to realize that if I do something that takes a risk and I do it in good faith and in service to my company, I bet they'll remember me someday when it comes time for promotion and upward mobility and fulfillment of my dreams. So at that time, people told me, that was a crazy risk. Why do you do this? You blew it, man. You could have been running New York. Why do you go for this? So was that a risk? Was that a miss? Maybe, actually. But I go to Puerto Rico, and here's an idea. I have my whole vision and my strategy mapped out in my mind. But I realize, just like meeting Garfield, that I got to read the room. And the room doesn't want to hear the American with the vision and the strategy dictating the pace to them. They want a humble person that listens to them. So for two weeks, I listen to what they want. You know what they tell me they want? They want a vision. They want to be inspired when they, want, when they come to work. And they want their Christmas party back. <laughs> and then I say to myself, OK, who would perform for you at the Christmas party? What would we wear? Paint the event. Let's dream. Well, it would be Hilbertito Santa Rosa, the number one salsa singer in Puerto Rico. We would do it at the El San Juan Hotel, the most glorious hotel in Puerto Rico. The men would be in black tie. The women would wear cocktail dresses and beautiful heels, and we'd dance until 3 o'clock in the morning. I said, I come back tomorrow. We talk about it. That night, I hire Hilbertito. I come back the next day to the meeting. Now follow this. This is a risk. Could have been a mistake. I get in front of them. I'm like, I got good news for you. We're going to focus on the customer. That's our vision. I'm putting the water back on the shelves. We're going to start letting you eat again. The other guy cut all the water and all the food out of the equation. God forbid you should be hydrated and have food in you. You know, you might even be more productive. And. <laughs> I'm bringing back the Christmas party. I hired Hilbertito Santa Rosa. Wow! Everybody goes crazy. They're doing Rocky push-ups. Puño, senor, you're the greatest, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I take an immediate risk right on the fly there. Some could say a mistake. That room was on fire with excitement. What do I do? I basically take a risk. I take a chance. I said, no, no, no. I know you're happy. We do not wish to dance to Hilbertito or anyone else as the number 64 out of 64 operations in Xerox. We choose to dance as the number one in the world, and we will do it this year. That's a risk. What do you think happened? 
instantaneously I could have called it a failure. All the energy goes out of the room. <sighs> Silence. They're probably dreaming, like how do we get this gringo back on the next boat to New York City? But I say, just hang in there. You trust me, I trust you, let's take it one day at a time. We trust each other. And I didn't leave a pumped up room. I didn't leave people elated and excited. I took that away. But one day at a time, one week at a time, one month at a time, confidence builds. Things start to happen. Actions start to get taken. They go from 64 to 55 to 50 to 40 to 30. Now we're going around the corner into the finish of the year. They're in the top 10, top five. We bypass the number one and we win we become the number one in that year. I really think if you want to be a good evaluator of businesses, uh, uh, an investor, uh, you really ought to figure out a way without too much personal damage to run a lousy business for a while. I think you, run a, you learn a whole lot more about business by actually struggling with a, a terrible business for a couple of years, then you, run by, then you learn by getting into a very good one where the business itself is so good that you can't mess it up. Uh, I, don't know what, I don't know whether Charlie has a view on that or not, but it certainly, it's, it was a big part of our learning experience. And I think a bigger part, in a, in a sense, than running, being involved with good businesses was actually being involved in some bad businesses and just seeing uh, how awful it was. How awful it is and, and, and how little you can do about it and, and how IQ does not solve the problem and a whole bunch of things. I, I, it, it's, it's a useful experience, but I wouldn't advise too much of it. <laughs> you know, I always think that you should start with the problem that you're trying to solve in the world and not start with um, deciding that you want to build a company. Right? I mean, the best yeah. companies that, that get built are, are things that are trying to drive some kind of social change, even if it's just local in one place, uh, you know, more than starting out because you want to make a bunch of money or, or have a lot of people working for you or, or build some company in some way. So, you know, I always think that this is kind of a perverse thing about Silicon Valley in a way, it's really which true. is that, you know, people decide often that they want to start a company before they even decide what they want to do. And that just feels really backwards to me. And you know, for anyone who's had the experience of actually building a company, you know that you go through some really hard things along the way. And I think part of what gets you through that is believing in what you're doing and knowing that what you're doing is, is really delivering a lot of value for people. Um, and, and that's, I think, how the best companies end up getting made. And you have a picture in your office of Martin Luther King and a picture of Robert F. Kennedy. Robert F. Kennedy, after his brother's assassination, someone said, uh, the difficulty for him, well, he'll have no RFK, as he was to his brother, Jack. So I might ask the question, do you have a Tim, as you were Tim to Steve? I think each person, if you're a CEO, the most important thing is to have, to me, is to pick people around you that aren't like you, that complement you, because you want to build a puzzle. You don't want to stack chiclets up and have everyone be the same. And so I believe in diversity with a capital D, mm -hmm. and that's diversity in thought and uh, diversity in any way that you want to measure it. And so the people that surround me are not like me. They have skills that I don't have. I may have some that they don't have. What we do as a team collectively are able to do some incredible things. And it's because we collaborate, and I see one of my key things in life is to make sure that we collaborate at an incredible level because we run the uh, company functionally. We're not like the typical big company that has in number of divisions and in number of P&Ls. Everybody is a is a functional expert and then we collectively to get things done we work together as a team because the work really happens horizontally in our company not vertically 
products are horizontal. It takes hardware plus software plus services to make a killer product. And so all of these people, if you were to line us up and talk to everyone, you know several of them. We're all different. And that's the power of it is that we're not trying to put everyone through a car wash and so they look alike, talk alike, think alike at the mm -hmm. end of the day. We argue and debate. If you were to come in our executive team meetings on Mondays, uh, you'd hear a lot of discussion and debate about something. We don't always agree on everything. Uh, but we have great respect for one another and we trust one another and we compliment one another and that makes it all work. And what we learn about people is that great people attract more of the same. But mediocre people also attract more of the same. Great people love to work with each other, talented people, because they challenge each other. They respect each other. They learn from each other. They give each other challenges, so, you know, constructive criticism. That's great people. They're not afraid. They want constructive criticism so they can grow. Mediocre people are the kind of people that are always tapping everybody on the back and saying, great job. Amazing. Give to, to each other easy targets. So on January 1st, you know 120% how you're going to get to your target. And you feel good about yourself. And, but you're not creating a great company. You're creating an average company. So great people attract more of the same. And mediocre people also attract more of the same. They like to work together, both groups. And because the company is what its people are, if you have a whole bunch of mediocre people in the company, guess what? Your company is going to be an average company. And if you have a whole bunch of talented people in your company, you have a chance of building a great company. So oh, you speak with a lot of confidence, and it's really clear how you got that confidence uh, because you have so, had so many years of experience. But when you were just starting out, like, how do you not lose traction, even though inevitably we all make mistakes like really early on in our careers? That's a good question. I think... Um, you know, I think people bring to a job a certain level of confidence. Um, and then you just learn to pick yourself up. Um, you know, when you have failures, you just sort of say, okay, you know what, I did the best job I could do, and now I need to figure out plan B. Um, and, uh, you know, so there were setbacks all the way along the line. Okay, so let's take um, FTD. So FTD was a leverage buyout led by Bain Capital and Perry Capital. And FTD was a member-owned association. And so it was quite different than a for-profit organization. And the thesis behind the Bain Capital and the Perry Capital investment was, we're going to take this member-owned association and we're going to turn it into a for-profit company. Well, for any of you who know anything about member-owned associations, people do business, companies do business with member-owned associations for many other reasons other than economic. And so we rolled into FTD, I was a CEO, and we laid off a big chunk of the workforce because we did the analysis that said, what should the revenue be per employee be? Only to find out that you know, half the florists that did business with FTD did it for reasons of relationship. And so we were able to take FTD from, um, we had to actually shift the operating profit from negative 60 million to plus 40. Good news is we got it from negative 60 to zero. But when you work in private equity, that's actually not the business case, and you've got to pay down all the debt. And so um, I was at FTD for about a year and a half and got fired. So think about that for a second. I mean, I remember sort of like, wow, OK, that's different. <laughs> and um, you feel terribly about it for a while. You feel like you let yourself down. You feel like you let the investors down. And then you just sort of, you know what? You just say, well, guess what? What am I going to learn from that? And you get back in the arena. And I think in some ways it's a personality thing, which is that you are, I, I love to learn. I'm constantly trying to figure out, okay, what could we do differently? What, would, what will make an outcome different this time? And so I think you just have to have that strength and conviction that when there are setbacks, and trust me, every one of you will have a setback if you already haven't, because everyone does in life. And you just have to figure out how you sort of pick yourself up from what is pretty difficult circumstances. And um, as long as you haven't compromised your ethics and your values, then almost anything is recoverable. I tend to stand out in a room and I see one other young man here with a beard and a turban. But beards and turbans will do that to you. You stand out in a room. <laughs> My part-time hobby is being randomly searched by the TSA at airports. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.
It's true, it's true, and I run a global company. So that's not exactly common for someone who looks like me. And I can tell you there have been a hundred times when I felt different from everybody else in the room, and you realize very early in your career that if I were not comfortable with myself, then I couldn't succeed. So it's completely critical to know that you should figure out who you are and be comfortable with it. What's important is what you do and how you do it, not where you came from or what you look like.